melancholy one. Dusseldorf, afternoon, late autumn, 1853. I am lying in bed, dressed in my purple velvet suit, my beautiful, beautiful suit, and I don't want to meet with Hans Gude. I don't want to hear Hans Gude say he doesn't like my painting. I just want to stay in bed. Today I can't bear to see Hans Gude, because what if Hans Gude doesn't like the picture I'm painting? What if he thinks it's bad, embarrassingly bad? What if it makes him think that I can't paint after all? What if Hans Gude runs his thin fingers through his beard and looks straight at me with his narrow eyes and says that I can't paint, that I have no business at the Dusseldorf Academy of Art, or any other Academy of Art either, as far as he's concerned? What if Hans Gude says I will never be a painter? I can't let Hans Gude tell me that. I have to just stay in bed, because Hans Gude is coming to the studio today, the studio in the attic where we stand in perfect rows and columns and we paint. And he'll go from painting to painting and say what he thinks of each one, and then he'll look at my painting too and say something about it. I don't want to see Hans Gude, because I can paint, and Gude can paint and Tiedemann can paint. I can paint. No one can paint like me, just Gouda. Tiedemann too. And today Gouda will look at my painting, but I won't be there. I'll be lying in bed, staring straight ahead at the window. I want to just lie on my bed in my purple suit, my beautiful, beautiful suit. Just lie here and listen to the sounds from the street. I don't want to go to the studio. I just want to lie in bed. I don't want to see Hans Gude. I am lying on the bed, legs crossed, lying on the bed fully dressed in my purple velvet suit. I am staring straight ahead. I am not going into the studio today. And in another room, here in the apartment, is my darling Helena, maybe in her bedroom, maybe in the living room. My darling Helena is in the apartment too. I dragged my bags through the hall, and Mrs. Winkelmann showed me the room and said that I would live here. And she asked whether I liked the room, and I nodded because it was really a very, very nice room. I have probably never stayed in such a nice room in my life. And then there was Helena, standing there in her white dress, with her pale hair, wavy even though it was tightly pinned up. Helena stood there, stood there with her little mouth above her small chin, Helena stood there with her great big eyes. Helena stood there and beamed at me with her eyes. My darling Helena. I am lying on the bed in my room, and somewhere in this apartment Helena is walking around with her beautiful sparkling eyes. I lie on the bed. I listen. Can I maybe hear her footsteps? Or maybe Helena isn't in the apartment. And your goddamned uncle, Helena. Helena. Can you hear me? That goddamned Mr. Winkelmann. I was just lying here in bed in my purple velvet suit, and there was a knock on my door. I was lying in bed in my purple suit and didn't even have time to get up, and then the door opened, and there in the doorway stood Mr. Winkelmann, his black beard, those black eyes, that fat belly tightly stuffed into his waistcoat. And Mr. Winkelmann just looked at me and didn't say a word. I got out of bed, stood up, walked across the room, went up to Mr. Winkelmann and held out my hand to him, but he didn't take my hand. I stood there and held out my hand to Mr. Winkelmann, but he didn't take it. I looked down at the floor, and Mr. Winkelmann said that he was Mrs. Winkelmann's brother, Mr. Winkelmann, and he looked at me with his black eyes, and then he just turned around and left and shut the door behind him. Your uncle, Helena. I am lying in bed in my purple velvet suit and listening. Can I hear you? Your footsteps? Your breath? Can I hear your breath? I'm lying in my room on the bed, fully dressed, legs crossed, and I'm listening. Can I hear your footsteps? Are you here in the apartment? And my pipe is lying on the nightstand. Where are you, Helena? I take the pipe from the nightstand. I light the pipe. I lie on the bed in my suit, my purple velvet suit, and smoke my pipe. 
Today, Hans Gude will look at the picture I'm painting, but I'm afraid to hear what he says about it. I would rather lie in bed and listen for you, Helena. I don't want to leave the house, because now I'm a painter. Now I am Lars Hertervig, the painter, studying in Dusseldorf, a student of the famous Hans Gude. I am renting a room on Jägerhofstrasse at the Winkelmanns. I'm not a bad person. I'm the young man from Stavanger. Yes, the young man from Stavanger in Dusseldorf, where he's learning to be a painter. I have fancy clothes now, a purple velvet suit I was given. Now I'm a painter, me, yes, me, just a kid, the street kid, the Quaker's son, the poor kid, the apprentice house painter, me. Now they've sent me to Germany, to the Academy of Art in Dusseldorf. Hans Gabriel Buchholt Sunt himself has sent me to Germany, to the Academy of Art in Dusseldorf, so that I, Lars Hertewig, can study to be a painter, a landscape painter. Now I am studying the art of painting, and Hans Gude himself is my teacher, and I can really paint. Other than that, maybe I can't do much, but paint, that I can do. I can paint, but almost none of the other students can. And Gude can paint. And today Hans Gude will look at my picture and tell me whether he likes it or not, what's good about it and what's bad about it. That's what he'll tell me. And then standing all around me in the studio will be all the other painters who can't paint, and they'll look at each other and they'll whisper and nod. They'll also hear what Gude says. First, Gude will just stand there and mutter and say, hmm, and hmm, hmm, and then he'll look at me with his thin eyes and say that I can't paint, and I have to go back to where I came from. There's no reason for me to study any more because I simply can't paint. That's probably what Hans Gude will say. I can't be a landscape painter, after all. Hans Gude. Today Hans Gude will look at my painting. Then I'll have to go back home and be just a house painter again, nothing more. But I really want to paint the most beautiful pictures. And no one can paint like me. Because I can paint. But the other students, they can't. They just stand there. They grin and they nod at each other and laugh. They can't paint. I lie in bed and smoke my pipe. And now, piano music. I hear piano music. I hear piano music from the living room of the big apartment where I rented a room. I am lying in bed in my purple velvet suit. The beautiful, beautiful velvet suit. I am lying here, pipe in my mouth. Lars Hertewig, the painter, is lying here on his bed, hardly an insignificant man. And as I lie here, I hear piano music. I hear clear and beautiful music, lightly moving back and forth. I lie on the bed and hear my darling Helena at the piano, for it must be my darling Helena playing the piano. It's the most beautiful piano music. I am hardly an insignificant man, and now Helena is playing the piano. And actually, my darling Helena is playing for me, because it's true. Helena Winkelmann and Lars from Hattorvog are in love. They've told each other so, yes. They've said that they're in love. We're in love, they said. And she, Helena Winkelmann, showed him her hair. Helena Winkelmann, with her pale blue eyes, with her long hair flowing over her shoulders when it falls free and isn't pinned up like it usually is. But he, but Lars from Hattavog, he has seen her hair loose. He has seen how her eyes sparkle. He has seen her hair when it was falling free over her shoulders. Because Helena Winkelmann let her hair down for him, she showed him her freely falling hair. Helena Winkelmann stood in his room and let her hair down for him. Helena Winkelmann stood there with her back to him, in front of the window. She brought her hands up to her hair and then let her hair down, and the hair flowed down her back, and he, Lars from Hattorvog, he, Lars from the bay with the little islands crowded together, the little islands that look like hats. That's why its name is Hattorvog, the Bay of Hats, and that's why his name is Hattorvog or Hettervig. He, Lars from the bay where there are little islands that look like hats, a bay on a little island way up north in the world, in the country of Norway. He, from a little island that's called Borgea, he, Lars Hettervig, 
got to sit in the chair in the room he is renting while he's a student at the Academy of Art in Dusseldorf and see Helena Winkelmann stand in front of the window with her hair hanging free down over her back. And then Helena Winkelmann slowly turned towards him, and then Helena Winkelmann stood there and looked at him, with hair falling down from the centre part over a small round face with pale blue eyes, with a little mouth, a small chin, with eyes that shined. Hair flowing below her shoulders, pale flowing hair, and then a smile on her mouth, and then her eyes that opened towards him. And out from her eyes came the brightest light he had ever seen, the light from her eyes. Never had he seen such light. And then he, Lars from Hattorvog, stood up, and Lars from Hattorvog stood there in his purple suit made of velvet. He, Lars from Hattorvog, stood with his arms hanging straight down, and he looked at the hair and the eyes and the mouth there in front of him. He just stood there, and then it was as if the light from her eyes surrounded him, like warmth. No, not like warmth. No, not like warmth, like light. Yes, the light from her eyes surrounded him like light all around him. And in this light he was someone different from who he had been. He was not Lars from Hattorvog anymore. He was someone else. All his anxiety, all his fears, everything he lacked and that always filled him with anxiety, everything he longed for was as if fulfilled by the light from Helena Winkelmann's eyes. And he was calm. He was fulfilled. And he stood there, with his arms hanging straight down at his sides. And then, without meaning to, without thinking, without anything, he just walked up to Helena Winkelmann, and it was like he entirely disappeared into her light, the light all around her. And he felt calm, like he had never felt before, so unbelievably calm he felt. And he lay his arms around her, and he pressed himself against her. He, Lars from Hattorvag, stands with his arms around Helena Winkelmann, and he is so calm, filled by something, he doesn't know what. Lars Hattorvig is where Helena Winkelmann is, and he is no longer himself. He is where she is. He is in something, he doesn't know what. He is where she is. He holds her in his arms, and then she puts her arms around him, and he presses his face down into her hair, into her shoulder. He is standing in something he's never stood in before. He doesn't know what that something is. And he, the landscape painter, Lars Hettervig, has no idea what it is he's standing in. But then it hits him, and then he knows it. Then he knows that he's standing in something his pictures are aiming at, something that's in his pictures when he paints at his best. That's what he's standing in now. He knows it, because he's already been close to what he is standing in now, but he's never been in it before, like he is now. He's never been where he, where the painter Lars Hertovig is, standing and breathing through Helena Winkelmann's hair. And he stays standing there in her light, in something that fills him. And he can't remember, lying there in bed, how long he stayed standing with his arms around her, around his darling, darling Helena. But it was probably a long time, maybe almost an hour that he stood there. And now he is lying in bed in his purple velvet suit and hearing the most beautiful piano music. And my darling Helena is playing the piano. And I, Lars from Hattorvog, saw Helena let down her beautiful hair. I saw her stand there in front of the window in my room and I saw her pale hair flowing down over her shoulders. And I saw the light from her eyes. I stood in her light. I walked into her light stood up from the chair and went to stand in front of her, stood in her light and was calm. For a long time I stood in her light, stood there with my arms around her, my face pressed into her shoulder and breathed through her hair until Helena whispered that she had to go now because her mother was coming home soon. I stood there for such a long time and breathed through her hair. And I'm lying in bed in my purple velvet suit and I hear piano music coming from the living room where my darling Helena is sitting and playing. And I saw your hair, my darling Helena. I saw you in front of the window and you let down your hair, and I stood up from the chair, I went over to you, I put my arms around you. I stood there and breathed through your hair, and I whispered in your ear that now we're in love. And you whispered in my ear, yes, 
Yes, now we're in love. And we stood there. And then we heard a door open and close again. And we let go of each other. And then we stood there in a light which contracted, then vanished. Your hair turned different. And then we heard footsteps in the hall. And you said that now your mother was home and you had to get out of here. You had to hurry. But first you had to fix your hair, you said. And you smiled at me. Because if you're not in the living room, your mother will come here, here to this room, and knock on the door. You said you had to go right away. And I saw how you went to the door, went out into the hall, and you shut the door behind you. And I heard you walk down the hall, and I heard you shout, Hello, mother. Here, here I am, mother. Back already, you shouted. I went to the bed and lay down. I lay on the bed and looked at the window where you had just been standing. I saw you in front of me. There you stood in front of the window. You stood there with your hair. And then there was a knock on the door. I hadn't even got out of bed, and your uncle was already standing in the doorway. Mr. Winkleman, the black beard, the black eyes. I got out of bed. He said his name, Mr. Winkleman. I held out my hand, but he didn't take it. He just turned around, closed the door, and left. I am lying in bed in my purple velvet suit, and I hear the most beautiful piano music. I hear you playing piano in the living room. I am the young Norwegian painter, Lars Hertovig, one of the greatest talents in contemporary Norwegian art. That's what I am, because I am a great talent. I can really paint. And I'm afraid to hear what Gouda says about my picture. Because really, can I paint? I can. It must be true, right? Is there anyone better at painting than me? Maybe I'm even better at painting than Gouda, and that's why Gouda wants to tell me I can't paint. Gouda is going to tell me I can't paint, and so I have to go back to Stavanger. I have no business at the Academy of Art, neither this Academy of Art nor any other. That's what he'll say. So he'll say, I should paint doors, not pictures. Today Gouda will see my picture and say what he thinks of it but I don't want to hear what he thinks, because he definitely won't like my painting. I know he won't. I don't want to know what Gouda thinks of my painting. I am lying in bed, and I don't want to know what Gouda thinks of my painting, because I'm feeling good right now. I can hear you playing the piano, my darling Helena, and you play so beautifully. The most beautiful piano music. From the living room all the way to my room, the most beautiful piano music is ringing out. I smoke my pipe, and I hear you stop playing, the last tones dissolving like smoke into the air and the light. I hear a door open. I hear footsteps in the hall. And maybe you're coming to me. Maybe you're coming to me. You want to show me your hair. Maybe you want to let down your hair and stand in front of the window with your hair let down in front of me, so indescribably beautiful. Or is it your uncle coming again? Is your uncle coming to throw me out? Will he stand there in the doorway with his black beard and his black eyes? Will your uncle stand there again and look down at me? Is your uncle going to knock on the door and just look at me and not say a word? and then say that he is Mr. Winkelmann, just that, nothing else? And then will he say that I have to leave, that I can't stay here anymore, I have to get out? I hear footsteps in the hall, and they are soft, quiet, and I know they're your footsteps I hear in the hall. Now your footsteps are coming down the hall. I sit up on the edge of the bed, I sit there and look at the door. I hear the footsteps stop in front of the door. And then I hear a knock. I hear you knock, because it must be you. It can't be anyone else knocking. And I have to say, come in. Have to say that you can come right in. Come in, I say.